Hello, hello, I'm Johnny Jungle Guts, the Top Notch Gamer, aka the Top Notch Gamer, and we are playing Let's Gay Artist Play Final Fantasy VI. I'm here with Christopher Russell, fellow artist. Thanks so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me, Johnny. Now, you are a LA person that has recently moved to Portland. What brought about that move? Um, I hate the weather in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I needed some rain in my life, some cooler weather. Yeah. And, um, got away from, just wanted to get away from the traffic, and, yeah, that's about it. And it's, is it, would you say it's working out for you? You like it up there? Oh, yeah, I love it. I love it. It's, um, I mean, it's, it's a great place to live, and I, my studio life is... Fantastic. It's so a little cheaper than down here, or what's that? What's the vibe with that kind of stuff up there? It's definitely cheaper than LA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, people up there complain about prices going up, and I guess they are, but. Um, people complain about that everywhere. It's just the <laughs> reality of America or whatever. Yeah, well, one of the things. Inflation. The state there. Um, there there's a state law banning any sort of local rent control. Banning it? Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, if, if your landlord wants you out, I mean, he can raise your rent like $5,000 in one month and, you know, okay. basically like pay it or move. Right. So, um, you know, a lot of people are having a hard time with that. Yeah, that sounds bad. Um, so to get you up to speed here, uh, the world is in ruin. There's been earthquakes and uh, explosions and all the plants are dying and the animals are withering away and the character we're playing as is just uh, attempted suicide. So it's all, it's all uh, pretty fun right now in the world of Final Fantasy VI. But uh, hopefully we can start to piece it back together uh, today. Let's hear a little bit about what going on what i'm supposed to do i have no idea what i'm supposed to do next okay after everything has after everything has happened you will find yourself in control of cellies mm -hmm. leave the house and approach the beach if you want to make sid healthy again you must only feed him oh oh. oh i think we already did that part sorry uh, skip to here okay the only thing to do here besides shopping is to speak with people. All right. M most people have something interesting to say and provide some good information. When you're ready, leave Albrook and head north to reach Zen? Sure. Okay. That's where we are right now. All right, let's get some good items going here. Would you like me to read the price list? Oh, that's okay. I can figure that, that out. Um, but yeah, this game is... Uh, the suicide attempt that just happened in the last episode of the show and earlier in this game was a big deal when this game came out about 20 years ago. I don't think they had really seen that in a video game before. It was it was pretty pretty intense for people, but uh, I, I liked it in terms of it pushing what kind of narrative arcs video games could have in back in 19, uh, I want to say 94 or whenever this game originally came out. Oh wow, this is 20 years old? Yeah, it's 20 years old. This is a port of this game for PC. A lot of people are not very happy with a lot of things about this port. They actually would like to the graphics to be worse than they are right now. Um, because a lot of people think these graphics are too bright and shiny and smooth, which I would actually agree with. The original game had a much grittier color palette and also a much... Um, it was just much more pixelated, and there was a, a grit uh, to that as well. And so there are actually people working overtime right now to complete a version of this game for PC that looks, in a sense, worse than this does. <laughs> and I can't uh, wait till that mod's finished, because I'm going to probably install it right away on, on this game. So yeah, it's, uh, it's about 20 years old, a role-playing game from Japan. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, Christopher, sure. where were you born? Uh, Sacramento. Okay. Um, yeah. What's that neighborhood like? What's, what's Sacramento? The capital of our great state, right? It, it is, and I left as pretty much as soon as I could, and sure. haven't really looked back. 
Um, but, you know, there's two rivers that run through um, the capitals there. The art museum, um, at the t I think it's actually a real museum now, but the, at the time I was there, it was all pictures of cows. Cows? Cows. And did you go to high school in that town where there were the pictures of cows? I went to um, high school in on the rural n north side at a school called Rio Linda. Oh boy, and how was that? Uh, it, it was not good. It wasn't good. No. I could sense that already by your <laughs> urge to escape. Yeah, I, I dropped out, or I took a... You're not from California, are you? I'm not from California. There's a, a test you can take when you're in high school that's it's less than a GED. Okay. But it's like... Is it a GRE? Um, it's called the California High School Proficiency There we go. And so if basically if you can add small columns of numbers and write a coherent paragraph, they'll let you out of high school. Great. And so I got out that way and... Um, and started um, working at the Gay and Lesbian Center. Wow! Um, With and not and no no college yet at this point. No, no. I um, I, I think the next term I enrolled in you know the local junior college. Mm -hmm. um, but but yeah, I didn't didn't know that I was going to be an artist at that point. So what was so brutal about that high school environment for you? Um. God, that's been so long. It just, um... I love to talk about high school. It's one of my secret, secret uh, joys. Oh, you've even moved the microphone closer. Yeah, we've got... I don't want to miss a single word here. Yeah, let's see. I mean, at one point, someone pulled a knife on me. Ooh. Um, you know, I, I was... Um... You know, there were sort of constant threats against me. Were you out of the closet? Um, I was not. Yeah. Um, like, had I actually said, hey, I, I'm, I'm a gay dude, like, I think that there would have been... Would have been even worse. Yeah. I mean, I, I had friends. I mean, it's not like I was... I mean, I was definitely on the loner side. Yeah. And, um, sort of, you know, more isolated. But, um, but definitely, um, you know, there was an element at that school that, that was... You know, I mean, there was a kid that drove his tractor to school. Okay. Um, you know, it just, it, it wasn't a great place. It wasn't good for the, it wasn't good. Because they, were they, why do you think, do you think they picked on you because they thought you might have been gay? Yeah, I think it, it was, I think it was pretty obvious and I didn't know how to hide it. Right, I yeah. You know, I didn't know what the hell was happening with me. Um, you kind of knew because you went straight to the gay and lesbian center, right? After you got out, right? Yes, yes. I, um, but I think that, you know, I, up until, um, junior high, I went to a little school that was around the corner from my house, and so I, you know, I, I walked there, um, was very small. A lot of the classes were combinations, so, you know, mm -hmm. they, they didn't, they couldn't even full, fill, like, a full class of first graders. So there was, like, a first-second combination. Wow, third. that's so, so, it's really small, too. Yeah. Oh, wow, I don't know. So you're, like, really in there with all these lunatics. Uh, well, that was, that was primary school. Okay. And then, like, day one of junior high, it's, like, moving into the school with 2,000 students. Okay. And, um, just, like not knowing anyone, just the social order was completely um, turned on its head, and I had no idea um, <laughs> what had happened. Sure, sure. Um, you know, it was probably a few hours before I was called a fag for the first time. A few hours, yeah, wow. Um, and, yeah. And um, then it was just, that was it. So, oh, can you read me just this little next chunk right here? Yes. <clears throat> When you arrive in Zen, a rather unfortunate event occurs. Head to the top of town and go into the house. You've got a certain time here, so be quick. Start by going up to the top and opening the chest for a heel rod. Left, left and bit and down into the room, you'll find a pearl rod oh boy. in the chest and a tincture 
in the chest at the upper left corner. Head to the bottom of the hall and open the chest for a hyper wrist. The one at the top of the stairs has a monster in a box. Downstairs you'll find magicite. In the chest at the upper right corner, drainer in the lower left, and another monster in a box at the upper left. The child is standing on the fireplace in the middle. Grab him and get out of the house. Now head to the upper right corner of town to find someone among the trees. Agree to buy his odd stone for 10 GP and you'll receive the Srafum Esper. Okay. Wow, I just got killed first fight there. Oh. That was brutal. I got turned to stone. That's what's that's what is rough about this here. Maybe I have an item I can equip that makes it so you can't get turned to stone. That would be so useful. So uh, so how did you get into the gay and lesbian center and how what was that like? Um <clears throat> let's see. I uh, at some point I'd started going to the youth group there and they needed youth group. There's a youth there was a youth group. I always think youth group I always think church but not always. No, no, definitely not religious. Yeah. Um, and they needed somebody to um, to plan events and um, do the safer sex outreach. This was, see, about 91, I think. Wow. Um, so AIDS is going strong right now. Yeah, that's it's a real big deal, um, you know, I mean, the, the drug cocktails we have now, like, didn't exist then. Yeah. Um, it was a killer. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I'd go out to, like, the local youth clubs and kind of sit in the corner and I'd have packets of lube and condoms. Mm -hmm. And we started, like, um, initiated conversation with little quizzes so people would... You know, and test their safer sex knowledge. Uh huh. And, um, and how old are you at this point? I'm 42. No, right now you're 42. That's that's a uh, that's oh, good at knowledge. That, at at that, that, that moment, <laughs> when you were giving out all the sex, doing all the sexual work, I, sexual helping. I was maybe 16, 17. 16. Um, wow. That's a uh, so how did but this is the thing that always uh, I am curious about before the, you know the internet how do you even find out about being gay how did you find out about being gay just in life would you say I looked it up in I, I looked it up in the phone book in the phone book in the phone book what did they have in the phone book on that topic um well they had a gay and lesbian community center okay and you know at some point when I was totally alone in the house I. Um, got the nerve to call, uh -huh. and it was a recorded message, but it mentioned a youth group, uh -huh. and um, probably months passed before I ever made it down there. Wow, that probably took a lot of courage. And so, it's so fascinating to me though, because now people just have knowledge at their fingertips, nothing is arcane in the way that it sort of sort of used to be in terms of finding out about things and because like I don't think I I have very little memory of learning out about like what gay was like I think it was like a song I heard on public radio that was about like someone having two moms and I was like what why would someone have two moms and my dad was just like I don't know and that was like the extent of that conversation and uh I think like the most embarrassing thing is that I think I really learned about what being gay was from like Will and Grace or possibly just like porn on the internet. Those were like probably like the two earliest uh, 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 knowledge sources on that, which is not good. They're not good. <laughs> not good. Uh, not good at portraying the uh, gay experience, either of those, either of those zones. So yeah. But how do you, so how do you go from working at this gay and lesbian center and doing this important, uh, you know, healing work and then becoming an artist? Um, I had a little office in a closet. The center was in a... You had an office. At 16, you had a, your own office. It, it was a 
closet. It, the, right, right, right. The building was a converted Victorian, and so they didn't really have a place for me. And so one of the old bedrooms that was already somebody else's office had a closet. But the okay. closet had a window. It was fine. Yeah. And so I would go into the closet of this <laughs> other office. In the closet of the game, Lesbian Center. And um, I, 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 I was starting to build little things. And um, it's just making these sort of assemblage compositions with the mm -hmm. little toys and such that I found. And sure. At the same time, um, I, I was learning the, the community center's Mac. Um, which had like a super rudimentary um, painting page layout program. Yeah, and so I started doing a lot of the ad work for the for the center for the newspaper for the gay newspaper. Oh, okay, you were doing some graphic design work. Yeah, um, and um, and s started getting you know people like at the service bureau because. You know, laser copies were still like five bucks a page or something at that point. Really? Yeah, because the the like a little like three hundred DPI laser printer was like thousands of dollars. Oh yeah, that's true. Um, you know, like a, a a a color printer was like um like a color page. You know, I think they the prints cost um like twenty dollars per page, and it was it was super primitive. I remember the watching them the um they'd pull the paper through um four times and mm. apply the the color um in in separate passes so it would pull the the paper through spit it back out and it would have have maybe the yellow layer and then pull it through and then you'd have blue and green there you go but that's a little so the people at the service bureau encouraged me to pursue graphic design people started like coming into the center just to look at the little things that I was building uh -huh. in my office, and um, people would come to the center because they'd heard about what you were doing. Yeah, or you know, a, a friend would bring them, or uh -huh. um, but it was, and so I um, I ended up starting school at CCAC mm -hmm. in San Francisco, okay, uh, Oakland. Yeah, um, and that was art school. Yeah. Um, Cal it was then called California College of Arts and Crafts, but they've since removed the craft from the name. Sure. I think I remember when that was part of I think I remember hearing that the, that school existed. So, so, but you were there for art or graphic design at this point? I started as a graphic design major. Mm -hmm. um, that lasted one term. Yeah. And then I... Um, I stayed in touch with my enrollment counselor, and um, she really liked my essay for some reason. I don't even remember what I wrote about. Yeah. But she liked it, and we stayed in touch, and she told me that I would... Um, I, she, she saw me in photography. She thought that's where I would excel. Right. And I didn't really... It was kind of a reluctant yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Like, um... But at the same time, you were, like, compulsively making art in your office, like, with no other... Well, I, uh, You know, no one was even sort of encouraging that. You just started making little act crafts in your office, in a way. That's pretty cool. But I'd had to... You know, I had to leave that job and move, because Sacramento's about 100 miles away. Right. right. So, I mean, I was just, like... You know, I was working at... At that time, at Starbucks. Oh boy! And um, oh, so you weren't full time. You weren't working. That was like a your side gig in a way. The gay and lesbian center. You weren't there full time. I wasn't there full time, but when I was in Sacramento, that was the thing I did. Right, right. But then when I went to college, it was like, you know, I couldn't. There wasn't an opportunity like that for me, and so I just had to get a job, um, yeah. pay my rent, um, get through classes. So, that's that's very uh, brutal sounding, Starbucks. Um, I didn't necessarily enjoy it. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
What year was it? Starbucks? What was Starbucks? How was Starbucks different in, what was that, 1992? You could not write on the cups. And I had to, I was there early in the morning mm -hmm. so I could get a full shift before classes started. Wow. And um, so if there was a lineup of 20 drinks, you'd have to keep all of that shit in your head. Because um, at that point, Starbucks thought it was tacky to write on cups. Right. And, yeah. Yeah, so it's just completely different in a way. Because they weren't butchering people's names. <laughs> so you're going to school now. You're when so she said you'd be good at photography. When how did she get that idea? When were you taking pictures? What were you taking pictures of? Uh, I I wasn't. I didn't have a camera. Um, I spoke with a friend who offered to give me his old camera so that I could take the class, and that's that's how I got. I mean, that's really the what got me to where I am now. Sure. I, um, at first, I really didn't like the process, going into the dark room with the smelly chemicals and sure. testing, 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 redoing, redoing. Um, and then somewhere in the middle of, of that first term, it all, it just really... <laughs> Yeah, ignore those guys. Keep going. It, it just really... It clicked. It all came together. And I just um, learned to, to love the process. Sure. And then maybe the next term I did... Was that, forget if it was the following term or the one after that, but I started taking pictures of... Um, of guys, um, mm -hmm. the random hookups in the park in Buena Vista Park in San Francisco. Okay, is that um, like the big cruising park in San Francisco? Yeah, um, or I imagine it's one of them, but um, yeah, I was photographing through a hole in my jacket pocket and... They didn't know? No, they had no idea. Um, I mean, obviously it was a cruising park usually there got a reason to be there in a way but maybe not some people just like it you know some people just like like the the, the thrill of it or something you know yeah um so uh and that was probably very provocative right for for to show that at you were because you showed that work to like teachers and stuff um, in the beginning, I got like a, a semi broken enlarger off of Craigslist and made all of the initial prints from a closet in my apartment. Okay. Because um, I, art school is way more, was way more conservative than I thought it would be. Yeah. And, um. Even in San Francisco? Even in San Francisco. Um. Yeah, I just, um. Yeah, I, I wasn't really... I thought I was coming from Sacramento, I'd be like the... You know... The, the, yeah. Yeah, like I... The uncultured, corny one. Yeah, and, you know, that there'd be all these, like, crazy rebels that, you know, had been in, like, the punk scene or whatever. Sure. And, and, no, and not really. Not very much of that. Okay. Um, just a lot of people who could afford art school. Sure. <laughs> um, well, there's still some of that going around, I think. Oh, yeah, there's... I mean, it gets more expensive every year. It's crazy. Um, yeah. So then you're doing that. Do you uh, go straight to grad school or take a little break? Um, I, um, I went straight to grad school and realized it was a total mistake. And that was at Art Center? That was the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Oh, okay. And, um, like, I'm not, I think there was a lot that, that was the matter, but there, um, but it, it just didn't work out. We didn't get along. We didn't, it just didn't work out. <laughs> we didn't get along with who? Um, you know, the... I mean, you work much more closely with your teachers when you're a gra in grad school. Yeah, sometimes they just get jealous of you in a way. 
and I, I think that there there was you know I got pictures published in a, a a book and you know like a Harper Collins book so it you know it was kind of a big deal for for me at the moment and yeah. I think there was definitely a little bit of jealousy but you know things like um, you know there was a teacher that what seemed upset with me because I didn't move into the neighborhood she wanted me to move into. Yes, there's that, those teachers that want to be, we definitely have that at Cal, it's those teachers who sort of want to be like your mom, you know? Totally, yes, yes. Um, and I just, I, I didn't understand, like I, like I, I didn't want the mom I had, let alone. Oh. Um, <laughs> you know, it just, um, so, yeah, the, the, the teacher that I really wanted to work with just wasn't, wasn't what I expected. She was like this badass feminist and, um, I just expected, I don't know, it's, a, I mean, this is all stuff I haven't really thought about. This was 98, wow. so... But let's get into that because I feel like there could be a relationship here. Why? What? What? what what's the? What's the family drama here? Why? Why do you have a sort of this? It sounds like intense relationship with your mom. Oh, I don't have any relationship with my mom anymore. I don't have. I don't have any family. They're all gone. They passed away. No, they're just gone from my life. <laughs> and why do you get rid of them? Um, no need to keep them. And what did they do to get there? Um. They're just not people I wanted in my life. That's that's all you want to say. That's all I want to say. Because my, I feel like I also saw some people when I was at art school who they sort of, if they were in similar situations, like I had a friend whose dad was like a complete deadbeat dad, never paid any attention to him and was really mean. And so he sort of transferred that fatherly need or something onto one of my teachers, Martin Cursells, and then when Martin sort of, you know, didn't keep up with that expectation, he just was really, like, free, you know, he, you know, after he graduated and that relationship didn't stay, it was, like, really hard for him, I think. But anyway, uh, so, so that was the, but did you graduate from from that school? No, I, I um, took a leave of absence after the f the first year and never came back. There you go. And what were you doing after that? I knew that I wanted to go to school in LA, that there were enough schools here that interested me that I figured I'd get into one of them eventually. Uh huh. And so I moved down here, made kind of the usual applications, um, UCLA, Art Center, Cal Arts. Oh gosh, look at this ram, it's terrifying. It's got like this huge overbite, it's really frightening. Yeah. I think, also look at how horrible these woods look. It's just like, looks like we're on The Walking Dead or something. <laughs> uh, so you came down here and what's, and you got it, and that's when you went to Art Center. Yeah. And that was a little better? Yeah. Um... I mean, Art Center, it's notoriously brutal, and it lived up to that reputation, but... Like, really harsh in the critique. Yeah, yeah. Um, Here, let's hear just this next little bit. Sorry to interrupt you. It's okay. Inside Mobles, ch check the three barrels on the left to find Phoenix Down. Enter the house in the middle and go downstairs. Go through the door and watch the scene. Speak to Tara again, and then leave the house. All You'll, right, let's find these, these. Here we go. You'll be confronted by a boss. All right. All right, the town. Wait, which which door? Which uh, house in the middle? Wait here, before we go in the house in the middle, I'm just going to go in these houses just for the fun of it. So okay. it's in here. So that was a lot better. The critiques were really harsh. Yeah, and yeah. Was that with, was Mike Kelly over there at that time? Yeah. Um, and he was on my thesis committee. And, what was that um, like? Um, it, it was all right. I mean, I pretty much, you know, I think I, I knew where I was going and, um, you know, it, I had a good committee and so that, you know, it went pretty well. There you go. Um, like, 
Yeah, I mean, I got toward the end just like really heavy into um, historical research about photography. And okay. So like writing the thesis part wasn't really, you know, difficult. There was a lot of stuff that was already in place. So I, you have to write a thesis at Art Center. Oh yeah, yeah. See, that's very different from Cal Arts, where you're basically just on vacation until school's <laughs> over. Um, one uh, one thing I did hear is that maybe at Art Center you were going through some celebrities' trash. Is that possible to be true? Oh yeah, stars. Faye, Faye Dunaway. Faye Dunaway. I, yeah. When I um, I, I I had kind of a conceptual goal of finding Faye Dunaway. And, uh, like in an emotional way? Um, well, I think initially it started that I just wanted to see if I could find her address and and write her a letter. And, sure. Um, but then getting her address was really easy. Oh, yeah. I, um, I met somebody who was um, working at the Screen Actors Guild, and they're like, yeah, I'll just look it up on the computer there and trade you for headshots. Mm-hmm. And so I... I got her address and then started a project with different sort of setups for for finding her and you know that of course involved going through her trash, mm -hmm. going by her house sure. at different times of day. Yeah, why not? Um, now, what what was like? What was it that sucked you into Faye Dunaway? Was it the whole mommy dearest thing? What was it? It, it was more Chinatown. Right. Okay. Um, just. It was something, like, this connection, I passed the L.A. River a lot, that was this main, I mean, kind of a main character in a certain way in Chinatown. Oh, of course. And, um, so it was just like, you know, this thing that's drawing me to think about her, and, and just the, I mean, I, I liked the character, this sort of tortured, um, tortured woman trying to escape, and, uh -huh. um... And so it, it, I mean, just in, in that regard, it all kind of came together. Yeah. Um, sorry, that wasn't super smooth, but... No, I mean, we can't always explain our, uh, our, our obsessions, our celebrity fixations. So, yeah. So I eventually wrote to her and sent her samples of my work and a uh, disposable camera and I asked her if she would take a, a picture of her Oscar for me. Uh -huh. And um, there was a, a pre uh, self-addressed stamped envelope, and um, she, um, she never replied. She never, yeah, she never. Um, yeah, but there, I mean, I started painting her picture, like these various attempts to find her and um, practiced her signature and wrote messages to her on the L.A. River. Yes. Um, like, Faye, why are you so far away when I'm not? Right. Um, <laughs> and why did you write that? What did you write that in? Spray paint? Um, I, I was using um, black hairspray because I figured if I got stopped by the cops because it, it's something that would eventually wash off there might be less penalty than if okay. I used Krylon right sure yeah. so, and it seems relevant somehow you know actress <laughs> right. superstar actress hairspray all that stuff um that's too funny but you were also at the time really into the into the uh the history of photography and that was, like, what your thesis was sort of about? Yeah, yeah. Um. And, and, uh, what else were you taking pictures of at that time? Um, I was, let's see, I was, I, I went through the Faye Dunaway thing, and I think in part because in reaction to the culture at Art Center that didn't necessarily have much in the way of support for traditional photography. Okay. I started um, acting more like a, um, more like a, a straight photographer. I um, just take fa pictures of things that I found around the city. And it was actually kind of the worst work I've ever made. Sure. Um, and, you know, it's, um, 
I j just wrote an article for Exposure, um, which is the journal for the Society for Photographic Education. Sure. And didn't even mention, like, my thesis work. Yeah, um, well. Yeah. I I might if I, if I had to write an article like that, but I might not. It's possible that it might not even come up. So, uh... So then you're getting out of there. Any major relationships that have obliterated your heart and soul at this point? <laughs> no. No? <laughs> Steering clear of those? Yeah. That's um, good. That's smart. So I, I left school and decided that, yeah, I just needed to kind of start anew, start fresh, clear my head. And so... I decided to write a novel. Right, um, okay. It's like, just like, this is your new beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wrote a, a text of taking the um, Baltimore Snipers as a love story. Okay, I'm not familiar with the Baltimore Snipers. What was that whole f deal? Oh, after the, um, after 9-11, <clears throat> they were, um, going around and shooting people from, like, a hole in the back of their car. Oh, yeah! Now I'm kind of remembering it. It was, like, an older man mm -hmm. and a younger guy leading yeah. Malvo, and I mean, it was, I mean, it just really intensified the paranoia of that moment. Right, I remember it now, actually. Yeah, and so it was just kind of, was like, you know, you have to, like, really fucking love somebody if you're going to admit your your desire to kill random people to them. Yeah. And expect that they will go along with you. Sure. And, you know, regardless of what their relationship actually was, I tried to um tried to write their love story. Sure. Um that uh that you know, makes sort of uh, sense. Did you ever see that Greg Araki movie where the two guys have AIDS and they just go on a killing spree? Yes. Seems somehow related. I don't know how, but... God, what was that called? I don't know. The I can't remember the name of it, but I have a friend, Dave White. I don't know if you know. You might know Dave White. But uh, he, w he went to a screening of that film in Texas, in Houston, Texas, at, with a mostly gay audience. And there's a part at the end of that movie where they say something about, like, the victims of AIDS and how our government has completely uh, abandoned them and all that type of stuff. Um, and even though the audience was gay, they were also, because it was Houston, conservative. <laughs> so there was a small contingency in the theater, in this one, you know, art gay theater in Houston, Texas, who booed. They booed at that, at the end of the film. Isn't that wild? Wow. Yeah. Uh, for demanding government action. For blaming the government, you know, essentially. For being for being angry with the government. The conservative gays couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't tolerate that, which really, um, which really blew my mind when I heard that story. But, uh, yeah. The living end. The living end. There yeah. you go. I love Greg Araki. He's great. Um, so, uh, how did we even get here? We were talking about, what were we talking about before we... Oh, the, you um, start You're starting over. I, I wrote a novel. You wrote the novel um, about the, about the snipers, snipers, right? Yeah. And, uh, how did you distribute that? Um, for, a, I, I did an exhibition, um, at a little gallery that's long gone called oh, sure. Akuna Hansen. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of set up where each chapter was a different station in the gallery. Mm -hmm. And I set out to get it published and people that work that dealt with literature didn't want to deal with the pictures. People that dealt with pictures didn't want to deal with the text. Yeah. And finally I got um a um a grant from Printed Matter. Great. And augmented that with, I just kind of did a DIY Kickstarter. Um, asked, <clears throat> asked my friends, you know. For money. Yeah. And just asked them for money. Well, there were, you know, you'd get this 
by a, a small print or a big print, and there were different sorts. And print of a photo that you'd made? Yeah, exactly. So That's bold, though, to not, you know, not have that sort of internet shield when you're just straight up asking people for money. I don't, I don't know if I could do that, but I guess that's what you had to do before these crowdfunding things existed. Yeah, and I'd, I'd seen uh, somebody else do something similar, and it, it still felt novel at the time. Yeah. And so it, it, yeah, and I, I mean, I offered some some very nice prints. Sure. At um, you know, very nice prices, so people that might have wanted my work, but. You know, couldn't have normally have afforded it. Yeah, so um, I, I think that there were good deals. Oh and yeah, I ended up getting enough money to print a thousand copies, and I should send you one. Oh, that would be lovely. Now, here's my question: okay. You're in touch with Printed Matter at this point. When did you first become friends with uh, Darren Klein? Oh, who is is he still the what is is he still over the hammer? Program coordinator. Program coordinator the hammer, right. Yeah. And Darren Klein, um, maybe 2001, 2002. Uh-huh. Oh, so for a long time now you guys have been friends. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're like the best of friends. I, right. I, I've been staying at his place and, mm -hmm. um, yeah, like every time I come down here, like when I came down here two years ago and felt like I needed to stay for a month so I could pretend that I still lived in LA so that my gallery wouldn't know that I would moved. Uh-huh. Um, cause, um, why not live life like it's an episode of Three's Company? Sure, why not? <clears throat> I mean, I stayed with him for a month. Wow. Um, he's... Yeah, I didn't know, I didn't know you'd moved that, you've been out of LA for that long. Yeah, I... I didn't tell people at first, um, and there was the gallery that I used to be with, they, um, they felt like it would be <clears throat> damaging to my career, that, you know, nobody would want to buy artwork from a Portland artist. Who was that? Louis Seussus? I don't want to you say. You don't want to say, but they, so, that was before you were at Mark Moore? Uh, yes. Yeah. And you can figure it out. You can I mean, figure it out. So they literally thought, okay, if he doesn't live in Port, if he lives in Portland, he's not going to sell. That's crushing to hear. Yeah. Um. <laughs> just for you know, just anyone who you know, I guess you have to be uh, fucking Richard Tuttle if you want to move out to the middle of nowhere and have a career. Otherwise, you just have to stay in L.A. or New York, and that's about it, huh? Yeah. Except I don't think that's true. Yeah, you just don't. You just don't even agree with that whole assessment, really. No, I mean, I I, th I think if I just finished grad school and moved, it would be a really different story. Yeah. But I'd been, you know, out of grad school ten years. I'd already had my, um, you know, a solo show at the Hammer. I you had a solo show at the Hammer? Yeah. Um, wow. And you know, I'd like sold out a booth at Nada, and you know, there there was enough stuff happening and. That it wasn't just like, you know, I, 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 it wasn't, I had some connections, some things that, you know, tied me to, you know, the art world. Sure. And so, um. So now, a lot of your work, you've, you've, it's a lot of, you s scratch into the photos a lot. There seems to be some relationship to sort of the ethereal. When did you first start, uh you know, physically altering the images once they'd been sort of, you know, printed and everything. That was, I, I started that with the novel. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I was making these pictures and, like, my ideas weren't really coming across. Like, um, you know, there'd be this, you know, set of thoughts that I was having when I took a, a photo and then I'd print it and no matter what sort of print rendition, I couldn't really... The thoughts that... The things that I wanted people to think weren't apparent from Sure. It. And so it was the question of how do... What can I do to sort of add this additional layer to it? Mm -hmm. And then um, at the same time, I was looking for a, a way of... Um, 
a gesture that worked with, you know, this really intense, damaging, damaged um, character that I made for the novel. Yeah. Um, and it, it just, it came together as, as the scratching. Sure. And then once I started... Damage the image. Yes, yes. Um, it's death by a thousand cuts on the body of photography. Right, okay. Um, you, you know death by a thousand cuts? No, what's that? It's a um, Chinese um, torture. Oh, wow. So the, they start by giving the subject morphine. Um, so okay. it's not really about pain, but about being disassembled. So they're, wow, okay. they give you I more feed. I can picture what you're talking about. So now. that you stay conscious. So you don't pass oh. out from the pain. And then after you, after the subject dies, they continue to cut into the body, like affecting the afterlife. I mean, it's oh, like, okay. we, we want to torture you beyond this oh, world and God. into the next. Um, so sometimes I think that's what I'm up to with photography. Right, when, when you're when you're altering those images. And what uh, what were you cutting into the image at that point? What kind of what kind of shapes or forms? It was super rudimentary at that point. There, yeah. there, you know, like I'd put a bird in the sky, uh -huh. or um, I kind of vaguely wallpaper something, or. Um, just play around with like textures and little a drawing little animals mm -hmm. um but i think that indefinitely you can see how far my my drawing has come from like these first pieces uh -huh. to like you know the things i'm doing now that sure. are um yeah that start to get tricky i mean i'm doing half tones in some of these yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. And at a certain point, I read a review of some of your work by Christopher Knight, and he was talking about the nautical influence of your work. Were you on boats a lot as a child, or how did that sort of come in? No, I was interested. The The boats came in. Um, <clears throat> I, was, I was interested in kind of this romantic... Um, like geometric abstraction with a romantic sensibility. Uh huh. Yeah. And so, like tree branches, the the um, the the lines of, of the tall ships um, had this. You know, they're all just the this linear quality that builds up kind of depth through overlapping. And so it was a, it was an attempt to romanticize this kind of postmodern painting technique. Yeah. There you go. Um, and, but the, the boats, um, yeah, I, I, like, when Rimbo wrote The, the Drunken Boat, he'd never been on a boat. Uh-huh. And, and so I kind of feel like, well, if, if Rimbo doesn't have to take a boat, then you sure, do Sure, you don't have to take that boat. <laughs> um, but I actually, um, I get seasick really bad and really easy. Oh, yeah. Like, even just, like, the trip out to Alcatraz, and I'm, like, super woozy. And, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I used to, uh, I used to, I got seasick once, but then I found out it was because I had parasites. I was in South America, and... Uh, oh, the parasites. Jungle Guts. Yeah, the Jungle Guts is where I got the name, Johnny Jungle Guts, because I had parasites. Uh, so, and my family was a sailing family, also, that's a funny concept, but we totally were. Can you read me this next little piece here? What you need to do here is enter the pub and speak with every single person. All right, we, we did that. Leave the pub and find the weapon shop. Below the weapon shop, a little on the right, behind the stuff piled up, is a man. Okay, I think we, we were talking to him. What do we do with him? Speak to him. Did it. Follow him to the docks. Okay. And board the ship. All right. All right, so that man is a guy who used to be part of our crew. Basically, the reason the world went to heck was because these three statues of, like, these goddesses that created the world got moved into different spots on a giant continent floating over the planet, and 
when the continent fell apart, all the all the characters in the game got thrown of all over the place, and then it flash forward a year. So right now we're just trying to find all those guys. But so uh, so you just had a show that opened, right? Yes, at Mark Moore Gallery. And uh, talk to me a little bit about uh, the work in that show and what uh, what brought uh, brought you there. Um. Let's see, this work, it's, it's kind of my first Oregon work, mm -hmm. and um, I, let's see, <clears throat> kind of, there are all these places in Oregon that people go to and photograph, and, um, you know, you stand in a certain position, and, you know, to get the right angle, and... So I, I decided that I, I wanted to do something with that. Uh-huh. Um, that I would um, go to these places, and I brought, you know, the right equipment, the super sharp lenses, and, you know, high-resolution sensors. Yeah. And, um, set up my carbon fiber tripod, because it has to be, like, geeky. And then I threw a um, colored veil over the lens before snapping the image. Like a gel or something like that? No, like a, a like a cloth. Like, oh yeah, that's pretty, that's totally you, yeah. Yeah, so it's like all of this stuff to get exactly the thing you're supposed to get, and then uh -huh. one decision at the end that completely um <laughs> completely destroys the effect that you would have gotten. Right, exactly. Completely destroys it, or is it there like a, just a little, a little remnant of it at all? Oh, the yeah, you you could look even without the scratching, like you couldn't really tell. Like you know, sometimes there's tree branches or something, mm -hmm. or you can see bits of of water, but it's largely uh, a color field with just little bits of things coming through more or less at random. Sure. And then I um, started scratching scratching mountain forms back into the image. Uh -huh. um, so it's it's kind of you know undermining the the ability of the of the photograph to accurately record and then replacing the sharp detailed image with with this more romantic um, imaginative landscape and there's patterns that overlap and kind of try and choke each other out mm -hmm. and I, the half tones I was thinking of is almost you know when you when you look really close at, at half tone dots and it looks like this whole little universe of stars mm -hmm. um, so trying to play up that angle and you know that you know the wallpaper is something that essentially replicates the infinity of nature mm -hmm. and then the um, halftone dots replicating the infinity of the universe and so it's all these sort of every element is this sort of failed attempt at be at going on forever sure um so so there you have it well how long is the show for until the 18th of june all right well everyone go out in the next two months to mark more gallery christopher do you consider yourself an artist or a photographer i consider myself a photographer there you go well thanks so much do you have anything else that you would like to plug right now no i um I thank you for having me johnny thanks so much for coming on the show this has been let's gay with johnny jungle guts uh everyone I'll plug the upcoming Eternal Telethon at Human Resources. That's going to be not this weekend, but the next. It's 50 hours of performances, readings, screaming, eating ice cream, getting naked. Who even knows what's going to happen? But it's all to raise money for an artist's retirement home. And we can't get there without the power of you. So keep tuned in. For more information about that, look it up at eternaltelethon.com. You can watch us live at Human Resources or live online. I'm Johnny Jungle Gretz, and this is another episode of Let's Game.